Assalamu alaikum, namaste, sasriyakal. My name is Farheen Khan, and you're watching The Aziza Show. Um, today, we're actually going to talk about poverty reduction and the impact that it has. Um, a lot of times, we think poverty is something that is very far from us, is you know, in a different country, and certainly there is poverty around the world. But we're, today, we're going to talk a lot more about local poverty and what that does. So, with me today, um, we have our guests Ryan Gurjan and Zena Hussain. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Great. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so I want to jump right into it. So maybe we can start with just sort of, you know, introducing yourselves and let us know, like, you know, let us, our audience know who you are and then we'll, we'll start the conversation. Do you want to start? Oh, okay, sure. sure. Um, my name is Zainab. I work as a creative director at National Zakat Foundation and Nissa Homes. Wonderful. So National Zakat Foundation was born out of the need to support the Canadian Muslim community. Um, Although there is social assistance from the government, but we found that that wasn't enough, mm -hmm. especially with a lot of refugees coming in and right off the bat, they don't necessarily get childcare benefits, healthcare, etc. So mm -hmm. it was really born out of that need. And um, our second project is Nissa Homes. Right. And um, it is just, to, uh, it's a transitional home to support Muslim women and children, to house them, whether they will be going through domestic violence, mm -hmm. homelessness, and just really, helping them become independent and uh, going on with their life. Basically. Wonderful. That's great. Welcome. Um, I'm a youth worker, a community developer, mm -hmm. and um, right now I am a school trustee candidate for uh, Ward 5 Mississauga. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, welcome to both of you. So let's just jump right into it. So let's talk about poverty. So how pervasive is poverty in Canada? Um, so it used to be that you go to school, you finish your education, you get a job. If you know things things happen, there's a crisis, you rely on the social service system, you get back on your feet. But that track is now broken because of many factors. For example, the economy is not what it used to be. A lot of jobs are either being automated or they're being outsourced. There's a lot more precarious work. Um, and just having an education is no longer a guarantee. One in four recent graduates actually don't really have a job in their field mm -hmm. and um, so definitely um, poverty in Canada is very per pervasive especially in racialized communities mm -hmm. 20 20 percent of racialized communities are way more affected than non-racialized people and um, that's why we're here and we're doing something about it Wonderful. Yeah. and I've definitely seen an uh a change from like when I went to school when I went to school versus like uh, as a youth worker I see uh, students come out from high school um, lunch or breakfast is like at the vending machine or um, <laughs> you know or they can't participate in after school programs because they're looking after their siblings while their parents are working two or three jobs right exactly. so it affects so much and there's a lot that um, can be done and great that we have organizations like yours Definitely. that's wonderful yeah. Well, what do you think are, I mean, you know, we talk poverty, poverty is a huge thing, right? So it's not just one. There's a lot of, you know, different sort of um, things that contribute to poverty. Like, well, let's talk about, can you define for us what is poverty and, and what it looks like? Um, so, so currently, um, there is no poverty line in Canada. And okay. um, so there are, there are different measures of poverty that are being taken, but officially there is no poverty line. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that the federal government is now going to come out with an official poverty line. But um, poverty is very different in different communities in right. Canada. So it can go from, in many um, geographic areas, it can go up to 40%. Mm -hmm. And for example, in the Korean community, it's, oh, it's about 40%. Right. So it really, and that's why poverty is hidden in Canada, not because many communities are so isolated from one another mm -hmm. that we never know, like a few kilometers from us, there are people that, are, that for example, cannot even buy a mattress for their, mm -hmm. um, for their daughter. That's actually a real case that happened to us just last week. Um, a single mother was on, um, she was on ODSP and she also had child tax benefits, but she was just living paycheck to paycheck to the point that if there was a need that arise, she couldn't afford something as simple as buying a mattress for her mm -hmm. daughter. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, it was like, what does poverty look like? Yeah, what does poverty look like? <sighs> um, and what are the things that contribute to poverty? What are the things that are connected to yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So, 
One of the things I find really uh, troubling is that um, in the Peel region, because mm -hmm. uh, I'm from Mississauga, and <laughs> a lot of, sorry, what I'm going to say is going to be about Mississauga, because no, I'm talking yeah. from my own lived experience. Of course. And uh, so poverty, I think, looks very different in Peel than it does in Toronto, mm -hmm. where um, people associate poverty with like homelessness or um, people uh, ask, like, on the streets asking for help, right? right. Um, whereas in Peel, um, it's more sleeping in cars, not affording rent. It's Absolutely. more, um, so it's not as in your face. And because Mississauga is so sprawled out, mm -hmm. um, there is no, there's not a lot of concentrated areas where you would see um, homelessness, like the way they see it in Toronto, right? right. Um, so for me, that that's, that's w what it is. It's also like, I believe the United Way says that uh, just one in five kids who are mm -hmm. living in poverty, right? Yeah. And that is evident in the schools because there's a lot of um, children not having breakfast in the mornings. Right. Like uh, breakfast clubs are, uh, oh, programs that. are really yeah. important. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are a lot of uh, children uh, missing school because they they're sick mm -hmm. and they're getting more sick and they can't. You know, there's some missing classes. So we see you know dropout rates in increasing. We see. Um, test scores going down because it's not a priority to focus on that stuff, right? right. So that's um, that's what poverty looks like. It looks like low test scores or, or low academic success. Right. Yeah. Right. And how do you guys feel about this? Uh, you know, the elimination of the basic income that's happening um, provincially. Um, do you want to take that? One? Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think I don't know what you think, but uh, uh, the. The elimination of the basic income, I think it was, I think it was because of partly of the attitudes that exist that it feels like it's a handout, we're giving away free things and people aren't working mm -hmm. towards the attitudes that I think we have as a society towards people in poverty where it's like blame the victim or it's their own fault, they should just get a job. <laughs> and yeah. um, I, I'm just saying that's I mean, that's, what that's, I, you're right. That's the I, kind I of perspective people have, right? right? And which, is, uh, which is ridiculous. And but, that's yeah. what I think that mm -hmm. was the large force behind um, killing the uh, basic income, basic income uh, right. pilot, and it, the pilot didn't even finish, so we don't have data to even know if it was. But what are the implications? Successful. Like, what do you think are the implications when somebody comes off of that in March? So, uh, I th I've heard of a lot of stories, like in Hamilton, from one of them, uh, people were coming forward and saying that they've already uh, made arrangements, and so they. Uh, and now because the government's like actually baking, breaking a contract and that's I think there's a legal case out mm -hmm. right now against this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not too well versed on it. Oh, I don't know. Do you know much about it? Um, so what I, I mean, just if you look at historical trends in, I believe in the 1970s, Dauphin, Manitoba had something similar. Mm -hmm. um, they had the, yep. uh, the Guaranteed Income Program and um, it actually did run for four years mm -hmm. and what they one of the trends that they did see was um, there was a higher enrollment in teenage boys in school right. and there was a lower um, um, drop in employment in the same uh, in the same demographic group right. so that means that they were able to afford to go back to school mm -hmm. and complete their education yeah. mm -hmm. which further means that they can become productive members of the society sure. they no longer have to do precarious jobs mm -hmm. um, so just looking at historical trends it seemed like it did work um, but right now we don't know because it was eliminated so we don't know the results right. of that. Right, and I think right. on top of that too, I think the, the partly behind that was to get rid of all like the different programs and stuff and say this is sort of the lump sum right. sort of thing yeah. and we get rid of all the begging for this or that, you know, all those programs you have to apply for and they're very invasive and all, if yeah. you've ever been through any sort of OW, so it's, it's hectic. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, it's just adding to the mental health that we're not even talking about that as associated. Well, with exactly. So let's talk about some of the other things that are connected <laughs> to poverty, shall we? So um, why don't we talk about um, homelessness? Can we talk about that? So what is the, you know, what are your thoughts on how uh, poverty and homelessness and housing are connected? So um, just in my experience at National Zakat Foundation, over 80% of our funds actually go towards paying people's rents and making sure that they have a shelter. Mm -hmm. What happens is that, as we all know, and I feel like on some level we all are suffering from the housing crisis in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, I was just reading up the other day, to, to rent a one-bedroom apartment in the city of Toronto is $2,000. Mm -hmm. But if you look at Ontario Works numbers, the maximum they can give you is about 700 something yep. dollars for a family of four. Yep. Absolutely. So the numbers just don't, they're not even close to, if 
close mm. to it. Even if a family has has exhausted all the government assistance, they mm -hmm. still cannot afford to live in the city. Mm -hmm. And I think um, homelessness, especially because we have such harsh weather in the winter months, definitely homelessness is a huge issue. And um, it actually costs the government a lot more than if they were to just do something about it in terms of healthcare costs, in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, um, their health is deteriorating and they're mm -hmm. in, and out, in and out of hospitals. That costs the government a lot more than if they were to fix do something to fix uh, fix uh, such issues. Right. Now I know um, Peel specifically is looking into some uh, homelessness projects. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember them off the top of my head, but I think there was uh, the 20,000 homes. Homes campaign, yeah, yeah. And they've also actually started to identify, they went through and did a, a whole audit of all the individuals that are homeless in Peel. Yeah. Um, and actually have identified, I believe, 670 individuals that are dealing with chronic homelessness and then are starting to kind of, you know, work towards eliminating poverty, or sorry, excuse me, homelessness, homelessness in, in a certain number of years in the next little while, yeah. So that's good. I mean, certainly they're sort of in, in their part of, you know, a larger strategy, which is the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness, and yeah. they are really doing their great work to we advocate. We do a show on this. <laughs> we did. We talked about homelessness. <laughs> but they're doing a, uh, you know, they're doing some work on really lobbying the government yeah. to, you know, introduce a, a, a home, a, sorry, a housing and homelessness strategy. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there is a housing strategy, right? Right, but there's no poverty reduction strategy per se at a right. federal level. I think they've announced something. Did you guys have thoughts around, around uh, that? The opportunity for all. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, um, yeah, so, I mean, I know there are a lot of critics around that mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. A lot of people are saying that they're just taking all the existing programs and putting a nice little bow on it right. and presenting it as, I guess, as, as something that already exists. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it, um, if you just do a deeper analysis, mm -hmm. like I said before, now officially Canada is coming out with, a, with an official poverty line. Right. So we are able to measure poverty better and then we have a greater understanding of uh, what Canadians are going through okay. and um, and secondly um, I know that they do have some promises mm -hmm. so by 2030 they're saying that about 30 percent they would eradicate poverty by 30 percent and mm -hmm. by 20 2030 I believe they would er eradicate poverty by 50 percent right. so I guess it's just we just wait and see and if those numbers are Sounds able to good match. I'm gonna we're gonna take a quick break and then we'll be back we'll be back right after this <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome back to the Aziza Show. We were just talking about the issue of poverty um, and basically poverty reduction in Canada. So with me are Ryan and Zainab. So we were just talking earlier about, you know, what are, so how pervasive is, is poverty and some of the sort of, you know, elements that kind of are connected to poverty. Um, but also wanted to talk about, you know, let's talk, let's get a little more personal and real. Like what, you know, inspired you to get involved in the work that you do? How is that connected to the issue of poverty? Why do you care? Um, so I got involved with uh, National Zakat Foundation because I come from like a second generation immigrant family and anytime we want to help people, mm -hmm. we're always like, oh, we need to send money back home. We need to send money mm -hmm. to Pakistan because what, what we don't realize is that just in our neighborhoods, there are people that need very basic needs. They're not. They're a month away from being homeless. Um, mm -hmm. They don't have enough money to pay for just very basic needs that we don't even realize those needs exist in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was kind of in denial, but then, um, but then I started to see a lot of. Uh, I'm sure you've seen them too. Uh, a lot of Syrian refugees when they start um, around 2015 and 2016, you saw mm -hmm. that a lot of them were in the streets. They were asking for money, and then I realized that maybe maybe poverty does exist and then I, I did my own research and then I saw that there, there is indeed an organization that exists and um, the more I looked into it the more I learned um, we have distributed so far in just a matter of few years 2.5 million dollars just mm -hmm. in basic needs Wonderful. Um, and we constantly have to turn people away just because we There's just cannot so help everybody yeah. um, so that's kind of my uh, my personal story on why I started working in this field. Wonderful. Um, for me, it was, uh, I guess, as a youth worker, I saw poverty firsthand as the frontline worker, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was 
it was disproportionately targeting uh, racialized folks uh, and women specifically, uh, single mothers. Um, I'd see their kids try to come through. Uh, they'd have to quit school to help out with the family uh, mm -hmm. finances to try and make rent. Um, yeah. Issues with, with not, I think you were saying the basic sort of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like yeah, the absolutely. basic needs are not being met. They weren't getting sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah. they were busy working. That's right. They were, they were studying or trying to do whatever it is to keep their family together. They were fighting with their family because mental health is a huge uh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, issue around that and. Also, um, th they weren't eating, it wasn't a priority, or being active, or doing any of that stuff, right? So school wasn't a priority, and a lot of uh, what happens after that is um, mm -hmm. students just try to go into survival mode, mm -hmm. and it's not about trying to do what's best for your education, or trying to make a, a better life. Or, or to break that cycle at all. No, mm -hmm. no, it's... Just living day to day. That's exactly what it became, mm -hmm. or is in um, parts of uh, Mississauga. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what sort of pushed me to really want to get involved and do, because, uh, you know, get, try and change things mm -hmm. as much as I can. Um, I mean, and it's so great after, because then you really get that satisfaction. Like one of my students from a while ago, right. um, at risk of dropping out of school, uh, family was uh, broken, um, had to, uh, I think CAS came in and mm -hmm. foster parents, and then it, was, it just escalated. And there's a right. lot of abuse, and there's a, and I just saw her d uh, the other day, <laughs> and now she's an officer with the police. That's wonderful. And uh, That's she's wonderful. helping other youths like who are in going through that cycle. So right. It's trying to get those key organizers, get them out of that cycle and show them that there is something better in. Well, that's why I got involved, yeah. Wonderful. And that's why I'm actually running for school trustee. That's so fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, please. <laughs> why, why are you doing that, Ryan? Tell and us. How political I could get. But no, that's the main reason why I am right. uh, running for school trustee, because I'm going to change. Uh, not that the appeal board is not um, addressing poverty. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's more... Um, progressive in terms of how it deals with poverty. Mm -hmm. Like you have to we welcome the world, which uh, newcomers, like a lot of Syrians came to Mississauga, they were able to go through that um, process mm -hmm. and that connects them to like settlement services, um, employment services, a bunch of, yeah, but it's, I think we can do a lot more. Right, definitely. Yeah. Right. I just want to add a little sure. bit to what Ryan said. Um, I know there are a lot of uh, government services that are available, mm -hmm. and um, they're not designed to make you comfortable. They're designed to just let you uh, just ha just make your basic needs met, mm -hmm. so you can find a job, etc. But it's such a cookie cutter approach that mm -hmm. it doesn't. What if you're a Syrian refugee, like you mm -hmm. said, mm -hmm. and um, and you're uh, so when they come in, they're claimants a mm -hmm. lot of times, and they're not really eligible to a lot of services, yep. right. and um, I find that they may not even know what they're eligible for. Right. An organization needs to exist um, to tell them, here, here's what you can apply for, or mm -hmm. uh, this is what you're eligible for, et cetera. And um, one of our other goals is to help them become productive members of the society. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, we had we had a we had a mom a single mom living at Nissa Homes and uh, she was doing her PhD but she was in an abusive marriage and she was at the verge of dropping out. Mm -hmm. We told her, just focus on focus on getting your education and then we will take care of the rest. Mm. She was able to finish her PhD and now she works for the UN. Mm -hmm. Imagine if she had dropped out and mm -hmm. then she wouldn't be as successful or she wouldn't be contributing as mm -hmm. much as she is now. That's wonderful. And that's probably like if right. there was a guaranteed basic income. <laughs> <laughs> that would allow well, people to yeah. do that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I just want to also say like, I mean, we're, we're having this discussion. I think part of the reason like you talked about, Ryan, like, you know, you, you're, you're running in Malton and you're, you know, you you were doing youth work in well, Milton, it's right? Ward five, so Mississauga. Part, ward you know. five. So the, the the ward that I'm running in is yes. really two communities. Sure. There's the Malton community, which I was born and raised and grew up in. Yes. And I think you were there too. Yeah. Um, but I didn't know you at that time. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Um, uh, <laughs> just full disclosure. <laughs> but there is the other part of Mississauga, uh, the ward five. Okay. That isn't. Uh, they're not seeing the same uh, poverty issues mm -hmm. that uh, people in Malton are seeing, but they're seeing poverty in different ways too, mm -hmm. right? They're still dealing with it, like not enough after school programs. Right. And, um, right. 
Yeah, you know, still, like summer camps not being affordable right. and stuff like that. Right, absolutely. No, and I was just going to say that I remember like growing up in, you know, first we were in Aaron Mills area in Mississauga and then, you know, like, and, and I don't, I don't want to just, you know, leave it at, sort of, for example, the fact that, you know, obviously, you know, our heart goes out to the, the refugees that have come here, but poverty is something that also affects a lot of new immigrants, period, right? And not just new immigrants. No I mean, it affects everybody, right? A lot of There's people. really no face to it. I mean, it affects anybody and anybody. All um, Canadians. It, I've seen Canadians. tons of tons of like citizens, not perm yeah. not just permanent residents, but actual you know citizens who've been there, who've born in Canada. Right. Yeah, exactly, generationally, and yes. they're still dealing with poverty, right? Yeah. Like I mean, precarious employment is huge. It's, absolutely, uh, being, being laid off, a lot of jobs being moved over, and exactly. So I mean, we're all dealing with it. I mean, and I think that you know sometimes there's this like stigma of like, well, you know, it's it, like, oh, it's that community, it's yeah. not my community, or it's you know those people, it's not me, and you know, it's not us, and it's just like we don't realize how close it is to us. Actually actually and sometimes that we ourselves are dealing with it right like I mean I you know my exa my example you know I worked at United Way and I've worked at a lot of no uh, different not-for-profit organizations my work has always been around anti-poverty -po anti-violence why because that's my lived experience right like I had to leave school you know school when I was 16 so I could start working to support my family that's a real life story right mm -hmm. you know I'm just really you know uh, grateful that like United Way and other groups had programs that could teach me as a young person to become quote a leader right that's how United Way of Toronto really helped me mm -hmm. I started to think beyond myself I'm like wait a minute instead of doing three jobs and they're like you know skipping class in the morning and trying to help my siblings and volunteering at the breakfast club so that we could also get access to it like all of those things and then thinking okay so if I actually you know continue to try and finish my education whatever it is and work full time and take care of my family then maybe you know I got to think big picture long run right like you know this isn't just about today this is about you know five years from now this yeah. is about 10 years from now how is that going to change my family right so I mean these are like the lived you know this is this is real life for a lot of us right I remember sitting with my you know I remember one time where my dad got really ill and we were home and I'll never forget my little brother who's now you know of course a big boy but at the time he was like two years old and I remember my mom saying to me we need to get milk and so this is what sort of got me into starting to work when I was 16 I decided that's it I'm done with school I just need to start working it's like I was actually standing there and mom's like okay well we need milk for the kids and I've got three kids you know younger siblings like they were very young at the time they're toddlers so we're like okay we need milk so we literally were counting pennies out of a jar like we put pennies into jars never thinking we'll use them right like this is never a thing but I was literally counting out pennies I get to the, the grocery store and my brother comes over with a box of cookies right two dollar cookie <laughs> I had to say no and that child was crying because he was like I want that you know and I was like I only have exactly enough to buy this bag of milk you know and that's really what for me you know the reality hit well because like what am I doing like is this school really gonna help me at this moment in time no what I actually need is food on the table how am I gonna make that happen right so that's mm. that's really you know when we talk about school when you talk about people's lived experiences that's what it's really about so, I mean, let's talk about racialized poverty, right? Zainab, one of the things that you talked about was, you know, the fact that you th you know, you've said that there's statistics that show that, you know, there's a, there's a higher rate of poverty in racialized communities. Can we talk a little bit about that? What do you, what do you guys think? Yeah, definitely. I think that's a reality. Um, and because we are, I feel like different communities are so isolated from each other, mm -hmm. even within the Muslim community, we don't necessarily realize the need that exists. Right. But why racialized people? Why, why is it higher? I know some people who say it's <laughs> genetics. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah, we laugh at that, but <laughs> no. they truly believe that. Um, I, I, I think, I know, it's disgusting. Uh, so, but I, I honestly believe mm -hmm. the reason why uh, this is a higher target uh, or a disproportional number of racialized folks in poverty is because there are advantages uh, that they just don't have. Mm -hmm. like. If you put your name as Ryan on a resume, I have a better chance of getting even a booking, getting an interview right. than uh, Raj Deep, right? Right. Is, is that a thing, Raj? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you know what I'm trying to but say. Exactly. Right? exactly. It's, there's uh, added barriers. There's definitely, there's definitely added racism barriers. that you know. Um, uh, if uh, there's more of a chance of me being uh, caught up in the criminal mm -hmm. sort of legal system, mm -hmm. just by being a person of color right. than there is in living with, uh, I don't want to call it Lauren Park, but I am, <laughs> like right. living in Lauren Park uh, versus right. living in like 
Meadowville or mm -hmm. where, where Aaron Mills, Aaron right? Mills, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. like exactly. even there, right? Exactly. So, um, okay. I think there are a lot of different barriers that we need to address. Um, Okay, well, I mean, we're very short on time now. Surprisingly, we've like <laughs> almost gotten, you know, to the end of the show. Do you guys have any like, you know, 30 seconds, last minute um, thoughts on, on this issue? Um, you wanna? No, you go first. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> um, well, we are, there's a lot being done and then there's a lot of room for a lot more efforts when it comes to racialized poverty mm -hmm. in whether it be in the province or just nationwide mm -hmm. and um, and definitely when it comes to racialized poverty, like Ryan said, um, because it's in the immigrant community, mm -hmm. um, one, of the, one of the things that we do see is people that are educated outside of Canada, when they come in, mm -hmm. um, they might be doctors, they might be lawyers, you they might be engineers, the yeah. they don't have the equivalency. It I doesn't agree. only affect them financially, sure. but it affects them socially For and sure. mentally as well. Yeah, so. well, I mean, I, I wish we had more time. I'm so sorry. I'm We're good, no, I'm good. I was just gonna say exactly that, so okay. I'm have to now. <laughs> Excellent, so, well, <laughs> thank you both for being on the show. Thank you. And um, thank you, audience, for watching. We'll see you again next week. Take care. Uh,